Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I hope you're enjoying our reading and discussion of this most prophetic book by R.W. Thompson, once Secretary of the U.S. Navy, who took it upon himself to assess for our benefit uh, any potential threat to the continuation of our Constitution and Protestant way of life here in America. And he found that no power on earth external to the United States would ever have the capability of overthrowing our Constitution, and that the only conceivable threat would have to come from within the country. And then he named that threat the papacy, the Roman Catholic hierarchy in America, concerted, will overthrow the government and the Constitution, establish Roman Catholicism as the state religion, and then openly persecute God's people, Bible Protestantism. That the Holy Roman Inquisition would be revisited right here in this country. And I see with my own eyes how prophetic and true this book is in its assessments. And now we'll continue with a book uh, that was mentioned yesterday on the broadcast by R.W. Thompson of this Jesuit priest by the name of Wenninger. It was entitled Protestantism and Infidelity. He equated Protestantism with infidelity. Remember, a Jesuit priest, and he wrote this book presumably for Protestants to read, but in fact, it was written for Roman Catholics in this country. And it established Protestantism as infidelity, as rebellion. It established the papacy as the divine right rule of the world, and it, it established the infallibility of the Pope, literally preparing the Catholic mind in the United States to overthrow the government and to persecute those who would not subject to the new government, the new papal government, the church-state government of the Pope to replace it. Now, in part of this book in order to establish the superiority of the Pope as the divine right ruler of the world, he says, he reminds Roman Catholics, and by the way, if you're following along, I'm reading in the second to the last paragraph on page 116 in the book. He says, in the ceremonies for the installation of a new Pope, he is addressed in these words, and then it gives the Latin phrase, and the interpretation, it's, they say to the new pope, as they're crowning him king, they say, Remember that thou art placed on the throne of Peter as the ruler of Rome and the world. Unquote. So this Jesuit priest is reminding the Roman Catholics of what it is, what is said to each new pope when he is elevated to the office of the papacy that he is the ruler of Rome and the world. Okay, and that should be in, inherently interpreted by Roman Catholics that the Pope is the true ruler of the United States and the world. Now, he says, in order, however, to make his Roman Catholic readers familiar with the manner in which the Pope would rule the world, when the power to do so was secured to him, we're talking about the Middle Ages, during the Holy Roman Inquisition, he had a little while before addressed a threat of vengeance to Protestants in the United States in order that they might experience a wholesome dread for their approaching doom in time to avoid it by penitence and submission. So this Jesuit priest is issuing a warning to Protestants. Should Roman Catholicism, should the priesthood, should the Pope ever gain the, the authority to do so, you will be persecuted. And it says, 
after defending the Roman Inquisition as a necessary part of the Roman Catholic Church's ecclesiastical organization, and coupling his references to it with the Protestant complaint of the unmerited persecution of Galileo, he says, quote, Protestants would do better never to mention Galileo in order that we may not in our turn be forced to inquire into their own excesses of religious hatred. Now, yesterday I went maybe possibly just a little bit too fast over this portion of the chapter. And for those who don't know, I'll refresh you a little. Galileo was Roman Catholic. Everybody was Roman Catholic in Galileo's time, everybody except those who God preserved. Galileo was Roman Catholic. He was under the authority of the papacy, yet he taught the Copernican theory that the, the, the sun, not the earth, but the sun was the center of the universe, and all the planets orbited the sun. That is the belief still held today. Galileo subscribed to that. That teaching is contrary to what the Roman Catholic Church taught. The Roman Catholic Church taught that the earth was the center of the universe and that the sun, the moon, and the stars all revolved around the earth. And it also taught that the Roman Catholic Church was the center of the earth and the world revolved around the Roman Catholic Church, in a sense. Well, when Copernican, uh, Copernicus and rather uh, Galileo taught their solar centristic theory that all the planets revolved around the sun and that the sun was the center of the uh, universe, the papacy saw that as religious hatred. The papacy saw that as a, as a, a purposeful undermining of the teachings of the church and the authority of the pope. He interpreted it to be a direct attack upon the papacy and a direct attack upon the Roman Catholic Church, and an expression of outward religious hatred. So Galileo was hauled in and arrested by the Inquisition. And he was imprisoned, and he was tried, as it were. He simply told to recant all of his teachings as heresy, and then be restored to... Uh, good standing in the Roman Catholic Church, but he refused to do so. And he was held prisoner. And now Protestantism looked at the case of Galileo and said, what an injustice was done by the papacy. And this Jesuit priest is simply saying to Protestants in this country, don't even mention Galileo, because when we get the power to do so, we're going to subject you to the same inquisition as was Galileo. Okay, so I hope I cleared that up a little bit. Now the author continues, he says, This is such an exhibition of cool audacity as we seldom meet with. Here is a foreign priest, a Jesuit priest by the name of Wenninger, in a Protestant country, writing a book called Protestantism and Infidelity. Right? Here is a foreign priest, sheltered by our own laws, and, clings, and clinches his fist and shakes it in our face, daring to tell us what we, that we will do better if we let the car of the papacy, with the Jesuits conducting it, roll unresistingly over us. For if we do not, we shall be punished after the manner of Galileo for our excesses of religious hatred. Now, the papacy viewed Galileo's teachings as religious hatred, that Galileo was a hater that Galileo was a rebel and against religion because he dared to teach differently than the papacy. Now, likewise, the papacy and this Jesuit priest, Wenninger, considers Protestantism hatred for religion. 
because it dares teach contrary to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. It has rebelled against the papacy. It has thrown off papal authority, says the Pope has no temporal authority in our lives, and it, too, is guilty of heresy and infidelity and injustice to the papacy, and it, too, should be subject to the Holy Roman Inquisition. Now, he writes in admiring contemplation of Roman ecclesiasticism, in other words, priestly rule, which recognizes external power, that is, force, as necessary to a perfect plan of Roman Catholic Church organization, the power to coerce obedience when other means are unavailing, to resort, to resort to force whenever the Pope shall decree its necessity. The Roman Catholic Church always uses force. Remember, we were talking about the Holy Roman Inquisition. That's force, coercion. And it says, Pope Pius IX had already committed himself to this system of policy. That is, force in submitting to the, dom the domination of the Jesuits, and they in turn were preparing the faithful Roman Catholics of this country for the bold avowals of the syllabus of error, which only two years afterwards startled all the civilized nations. And the time selected by this author to do his part for this work in the United States displayed admirable sagacity and tact. When his book made its appearance, our country was laboring in the travail of a fearful civil war. Immense armies were in the field, marshaled against each other in the most deadly conflict, and I will just say a Jesuit fomented conflict. Divide and conquer was the strategy, while at the same time these Jesuit priests were running around the country proclaiming the infallibility of the Pope, that every, every man, woman, and child must obey the Pope as though they were to obey Christ, and that our Protestant form of government, our Constitution, was heresy. See the multifaceted attack that the papacy was levying, levying against our country at this time, even while it was embroiled in a civil war. And the author continues, he said, It seemed doubtful which of the contending parties in the civil war would win the final, convert, uh, the, the final victory, whether the, def the defenders of the government would win or lose it. The doubtful nature of the contest, the apparent differences of opinion in reference to to its result, even in the state supporting of the Union and other combinations of circumstances too recent to have been forgotten, all conspired to excite in the minds of European imperialists, that is, the divine right rulers of Europe who had been ousted by the Protestant Reformation, had excited it in the minds of the European imperialists the hope and possibly the belief that the days of our civil institutions were numbered and could not be lengthened out much longer. You see, the imperialists of Europe, those kings who, were, who had received their crowns from the papacy, were with the papacy in the hopes that this Protestant form of government would ultimately be destroyed. It was the most powerful Protestant institution in the world. It was the only government established in the world that had the full influence of Protestantism. It was the, the, the shining example of what liberties Protestantism could produce. What rights, civil rights, that Protestantism could be could produce. And the survival of these imperialists, the survival of the papacy, depended upon the destruction of this Protestant experiment called the United States of America, so that the papacy could plunge the work, could declare Protestantism an ultimate failure, and then restore its papal throne 
both in this country and in Europe, and restore these imperial kings to their thrones under papal sanction. So the papacy had everything at stake in destroying this country. That's why the Jesuits fomented the Civil War, and that's why these priests are allowed to go around in this free country and promote the overthrow of this country, taking advantage of the Protestant liberty of freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. This Jesuit priest exercised that freedom to say this whole, the, the, the entire basis of this country and this government was heretical. It was Protestant. It was rebellious. It should be overthrown by every devout Roman Catholic in the country. And the, the land the United States of America be restored under papal supremacy and a government established that would be conducive to the papacy. Now he says, foremost among these royalists was the favorite son of the Roman Catholic Church, the corrupt and false-hearted emperor of France, who with one hand ruled his subjects with unmitigated severity, while with the other he held the Pope upon his temporal throne, from which, but for him, he would have been hurled by the outraged Italians after the Battle of Solferino. With this perfidious monarch, it was fixed habit to profess one thing while doing or trying to do another. At the moment he announced that the empire is in peace, he was engaged in corrupting schemes designed to give perpetuity to absolutism, that is, popery. With him and the Pope, the thought was a common one that kings governed by divine right, and therefore that the choice of their own mode of civil government by the people is a violation of God's law. Neither of them stopped to inquire what popular right would be trampled down by the establishment of this principle among those who, would, who had resisted and repudiated it, that is, Protestants, nor how much, it would be, how much it would block up the way in which the car of progress was so triumphantly moving. These were matters they considered fit only for revolutionists and heretics, who for daring to assert the right of mankind to self-government were denounced as Protestants and infidels and cut off by bulls and excommunication from all the sacraments and the protections of the Roman Catholic Church. This unity of purpose and principle on the part of Napoleon and the Pope led without difficulty to the adoption of a common plan of operations which required no formal concordat to define its terms, whereby it was intended to secure in the triumph of imperialism and to plant the flag of the Latin race in every nation of the earth, especially in the United States, where under the tolerance of Protestantism, Jesuitism was growing bolder every day. The plan of operations were doubtless well understood by the army of the hierarchy, which was first put in motion. They constituted the skirmish line, the advance guard of the strong columns held in reserve. The special duty assigned them was akin to that performed by his Jesuit author of Protestantism and Infidelity. The arraignment of Protestantism as a fraud and a cheat as infidelity and heresy, and therefore, with the curse of God resting upon it, and thus to prepare the Roman Catholic mind throughout the world for that fatal blow which the imperial conspirators expected to strike. That fatal blow is that which R.W. Thompson and myself and other researchers all predict an inquisition, an anti-Protestant inquisition in this country. This country of rebellion and heresy is going to be brought to heel, is going to be forced to bow and submit to the Pope or be destroyed. 
that is the expected strike that the papacy expects to wage in this in this country with the help of his Roman Catholic hierarchy. And it says to Napoleon the Third was assigned the most dangerous and exposed, but not the more active duty of augmenting the strength of despotism when the fall of our institutions should clear the chief obstruction out of the way. Accordingly, he intrigued with England and Spain. Yes, Napoleon III was even going to enlist the help of England and Spain to unite their armies with that of France and send the combined force to Mexico. Now remember, this is during the Civil War when this country was in a, 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 a bloody internal conflict. Napoleon III of France organized Spain and England together in a combined force to go to Mexico under the false pretense of protecting their mutual pecuniary interests, but with the real design, as subsequent events ab abundantly proved, of sub subjugating that country, all that is Mexico, already Roman Catholic, of placing its crown upon the head of an alien prince, and thus to prepare upon the fall of our government to move up the papal armies from Mexico to the United States and turn over this country to the quote-unquote Latin race, so that Rome should again become the mistress of the world, and this Pope King the ruler over the whole earth. So that was the intrigue. The Jesuits fomented the Civil War, and at the same time, they were organizing their own land invasion from Mexico. Sound familiar? You ever wonder why our government won't close the border with Mexico? Because it's a Roman Catholic country. They're dissolving the border between the United States and Mexico. Could it be, possibly? that the Pope is planning another land invasion, I consider the unrestrained immigration of Mexicans into this country as a land invasion. You won't hear many other people repeat that, but that's the, that's the way I see it. Because 98% of the people coming across that border are devout Roman Catholics, which means they vote and do as their priests say. They're making America Catholic. Now, this attempted land invasion of the United States failed by divine providence. But before we get into that, we're going to read an article, or a, a note that the author gives us just now. He says, What Pope Pius IX expected to gain from, for the papacy will be seen by a letter subsequently written by him to Maximilian. Now, Maximilian was the one assigned to go to Mexico which had rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church, had nationalized all Roman Catholic Church property, had taken back all the land and given it back to the people because they were starving to death. Mexico finally got sick and tired of the papal system, uh, papal oppression. The people lived in squalor. They lived in ignorance. The priests owned all the land, and the churches were gold-plated. And the government of Mexico finally got fed up and kicked out the, the priests, nationalized all Roman Catholic Church property, returned the wealth to the people, and the Pope simply said, I won't have it. I will raise up Napoleon and any other forces I can, and we'll take back Mexico, and then we'll go into the United States of America to mop up after the Civil War. That's my take on it. For the break, we were beginning to read a note that Pope Pius IX wrote to his his uh, his Majesty Maximilian, who was assigned by the papacy to go to Mexico, overthrow the Mexican rebellion, regain the church property and reestablish the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy as the government of the country, and then to charge into civil war-torn America to help mop up for the Jesuits. 
And it says, Your Majesty is well aware that in order effectually to repair the evils occasioned by the revolution and to bring back as soon as possible happy days for the Roman Catholic Church, the, church, the, the Catholic religion must, above all things, continue to be the glory and the mainstay of the Mexican nation to the exclusion of every other dissenting worship that the Roman Catholic bishops must be perfectly free in the exercise of their pastoral ministries, that the religious orders should be reestablished or organized comfortably with the instructions and the powers which we have given, that the patrimony of the church, that is church property and wealth, and the rights which attach to it may be maintained and protected, that no person may obtain the faculty of teaching or publishing false and subversive tenets, that instruction, whether public or private, should be directed and watched over by the ecclesiastical authority, in other words, the Roman Catholic priesthood, they're getting control of the education system in Mexico, and that, in short, the chains may be broken up, uh, may be broken, which up to the present time have held down the Roman Catholic Church in a state of dependence and subject to the arbitrary rule of the civil government. That's right. The Mexico was trying to establish, like all the Roman Catholic countries in Europe who had thrown off the temporal power of the Pope, trying to establish their own constitutional republic. And Maximilian was sent by Pope Pius IX, the first infallible pope of the Roman Catholic Church, to stop the rebellion, conquer once again Mexico, make it Roman Catholic, unite church and state, and then marshal an army to go into war-torn the United States of America. Quite a an elaborate scheme, don't you think? But God had other plans. R.W. Thompson says the enterprise was of grand proportions, but it so happens that God disposes of the schemes of men as is most suited to his own providential government. Protestant England, discovering how she had been deceived and duped by the intrigue, withdrew her army in disgust. Roman Catholic Spain becoming sensible of the inferiority into which the papacy had reduced her.